Okay, um, dear friends, um, last session, at least for me, and I think also for most of you, um, here um, we are in a meeting of the IS3C, or the Internet Standards Security and Safety Coalition, which is actually the name of one of the dynamic coalitions here at, uh, at, the, I uh, at the IGF. Um, the topic of this uh, uh, of this workshop is, or the title of this workshop is "Procuring Modern Security Standards by Governments and Industry," and that's part of the interest of this dynamic coalition. Um, in general, when you look at security being deployed uh, uh, in organizations, then there is always an informed self-interest to protect yourself. The problem with securing the internet is that that is security for the common good. And usually you're securing something within your infrastructure to protect yourself partly, but also others. So there are all kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, economic uh, incentive problems uh, um, uh, that, that make that the introduction of uh, uh, internet security standards and common practices uh, might be in, uh, difficult. And uh, this dynamic coalition uh, sets out to s both study uh, and stimulate uh, the deployment of, uh, of those modern internet standards. Um, I'm looking at Wout, seeing if I'm summarizing this well. Um, and uh, we're here to discuss a number of the, the work items that the coalition has been working on. Can I have the next slide? Pew, uh, ah, can I have the next slide? Yes. So we're here with, a, with a, a bunch of speakers and panel members. My name is Olaf Kolkman. I'm the, uh, uh, from the Internet Society. We have uh, Satish Babu. We have uh, Flavio Ken, uh, Kenji Janai, uh, Liz uh, Orembo will uh, join us uh, later. Wouter Natris is here at the end of the table. Uh, Satish, yeah, yeah, I point, uh, uh, Satish and Flavio are also at this table, of course. Gerben Klein-Balting um, is online, if everything is well. Annemieke is to my left, uh, to the right for the watchers. And uh, Gilberto Zorella is uh, in Brazil and online. The layout of the session, you can skip this slide, everybody knows uh, by now that I'm that person. Um, I'm giving the introduction at this moment, then uh, Gerben Klein-Balting and Annemieke Toursen will talk a little bit about the role of open standards, particularly in procurement experience in the Netherlands. A nice presentation. Um, then, oh wait, wait, wait. Um, uh, then Wout de Natus will talk a little bit with Liz, uh, who will be there. Uh, then we have an uh, opportunity for questions from the audience, both online and here in the room. Next slide. Um, Satish Babu will then present some perspectives. At that time, we're close to uh, 2.30 already. And then we'll have a, uh, a panel discussion. Oh, no, we will have uh, uh, Gilberto Zarello and Flavio um, giving some perspectives from Brazil. Um, and after that, we have only a couple of minutes for uh, a panel discussion and further questions. Um, if everybody is still uh, awake and not uh, fallen asleep from a long, long week. So um, let's go without further ado. Um, the session on, uh, 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 on the platform internet standards in the Netherlands. But be before we go there, um, uh, Alyssa um, Hever from the Dutch government, uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, is here, and she would like to say a couple of words. Uh, camera swing to the uh, <laughs> to the micro microphone about uh, uh, about this initiative. Yes. So my name is Alyssa Hever. I'm uh, from the Dutch government, um, from the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And um, the Netherlands has, uh, or the Dutch government has been uh, fully supportive of this uh, platform internet standards and of uh, the forum standardization where Anamika is from. Um, and this, uh, these two standard uh, uh, public, public-private partnerships um, have been really crucial in the Netherlands to 
um, at least for the Dutch government to uh, to f to further uh, adopt standards that are deemed um, uh, of importance. And I think it's um, um, it's a, it's good that we're having this session here. And I would also really like to encur encourage other governments to um, to work together with uh, the with with experts in their countries on uh, internet standards and on other types of standards um, to see which standards uh, um, should be adopted by governments um, and used for procurement. Um, you'll hear a lot more about that, and um, um, yeah, I, I, I really think that um, we should. Um, well, I'm, I'm really pleased that we have this this good relationship in the Netherlands, and uh, and I hope to see this uh, this spread across the world. So, have a good session here. I guess that's back to me. Um, yes. Uh, without further ado, um, um, I think we are going to listen to Gerben. So, if the uh, Zoom room can be open so that Gerben can can speak. That would be great. Gerben, are you with us? I am with you, but can you hear me? And now we w now we can hear you. Hello, Gerben. Good morning. Well, um, as mentioned by Olaf. Um, talking about standards is not not relevant just for the the individual user of the internet, but for the good, common good. And it has been some, I think, ten years ago that, um, amongst other people, Olaf and I met at a meeting at the Ministry of Economic Affairs in the Netherlands, where we sat together with organisations uh, across the board from, uh, let's say, the Internet Society in the Netherlands as well as uh, Dutch government. And all of us were involved in some way in uh, trying to bring open, modern standards forward. But we all realized that this was not an easy thing to do. Uh, the adoption process is uh, sometimes very slow. It can take many years before the, the actual take up of a new standard is realized. And we, discussing this topic, we realized that uh, we, we could do something perhaps in close cooperation in a public-private initiative that then was called uh, the Platform Internet Standards. Um, our first meeting was around nine years ago of this new body, of this new platform. And we soon realized that we really had to uh, stick together, um, government, public organizations, private organizations, to make this work. Um, and one of the things that we uh, soon realized is that if we would like to um, make modern internet standards uh, more acceptable for everybody, it would help if there would be uh, some kind of test tool to make sure that everybody could see if their own website and email or local connection could actually use these modern standards, and if they use them, um, whether these standards are um, uh, set up in the right way. And of course, this is not something that many individuals will do themselves. Uh, so we, we initially focused at organizations, hoping to attract both the technical uh, people in, in such an organization, as well as the board members because it's not something that can be done by um, IT technicians alone. It has to be accepted by uh, the board of an organization as well. This test tool, and some of you may, may know it or even use it, it can be found at the website internet.nl. And there we dive into uh, many of these modern open standards, um, but we do not only explain the standard and test the standard, we also point out how you can go, and this is the procurement part, to your supplier if something is not set up correctly or if a standard is simply not used. Um, so one of the things that we offer is insight in uh, does your website, does your email, does your local connection function correctly with these modern standards? And if not, uh, what would uh, be the kind of solution that you can apply? Um, at this website, you will also find the Hall of Fame 
of those websites that uh, are already 100% up to uh, speed with these modern standards, but also a Hall of Fame of hosting organizations that can help you if you want to have their support to have your own website and email set up in a correct way. And we have seen that the use of internet.nl by many organizations and many individuals is growing and growing. I think we will pass uh, uh, over 1 million tests uh, this year in the year 2023 itself. And we come from, let's say, 650,000 tests last year. And we do also see tests in a more technical environment, our API and our dashboard, where you can run multiple domains, um, multiple email uh, servers at once, and see if these are all set up correctly. So these modern standards, we think, will benefit everybody because your safety and security and connectivity online will be enhanced uh, greatly. So what we try to achieve is that as many people have um, and organizations have these modern standards so that we can all benefit from an internet that is functioning correctly. And the good news is, um, as uh, Alisa mentioned in the beginning, um, it would be great if, if, if other uh, countries would, would uh, have the same idea about these modern open standards and uh, applying them. And we are more than, than, than um, happy to, to help other organizations, other countries, to set up uh, something similar. And some countries already have, like uh, Brazil, uh, like uh, Denmark, uh, like uh, Singapore. So we see initiatives around the globe in uh, the adoption of uh, these standards and the tooling. And we are open to learn from other experiments as well. And you can't do without explanation. And uh, the explanation can be found at the website itself but also uh, in the help and the help team that we have to provide organizations with support. And we have, have also uh, made some tooling available and not only from our platform internet standards, but also from uh, international and national organizations that have the same kind of idea. So for, for now, I would like to hand over to Annemiek and uh, let her explain what the Dutch government does with the Forum Standardisatie. And you're more than welcome to uh, to visit internet.nl and make use of our test tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerbe, for your introduction. And thank you for attending uh, our session, uh, all of you in the here abroad, uh, here and abroad. Uh, my name is Annemieke Toorza from the Netherlands uh, Standardization, and I like to uh, tell more about uh, how. Holland and the Netherlands uh, do something about adoption of open standards. Why actually open standards? Um, uh, sorry. Um, I am uh, from the Forum uh, the Netherlands uh, Standardization, and the standardization is a think tank uh, and aims for more interoperability of the Dutch government. Open standards are uh, key to this goal, and therefore the standards from S uh, Forum actively promotes and advises the Dutch government about the usage of open standards. So the Forum has about 25 members with various backgrounds from government, business and science. And the main topic of the Forum is the organization of the so-called comply or explain list of open standards. And this list should be applied by the complete public sector uh, organizations, central as well as decentral. So why open uh, standards? Uh, all open standards we promote regards information exchange uh, between governments and citizens and also between governments themselves. So with open, we mean that the speci uh, specifications of the standards is publicly available and that interested parties can participate in the standardization process. So there should be no single party that controls the standard. So open standards are more important of are important because of the interoperability as mentioned here and the security which influences trust of course, accessibility as government is obliged to inform the com whole society of the society as a whole and vendor neutrality. Um, when it comes to internet standards, 
the Dutch government has a threefold strategy sh shown here in the picture. I will go briefly through it. Uh, first, the standardization form can mandate specific open standards. And we can do so by including standards on this list, the so-called comply or explain list. This is done after carefully research in which we also uh, consult technical experts. And standards on this list should be required when governments are investing in new IT systems or services. As we survey on the su some uh, bigger ICT organizations within the Dutch government, we have seen quite some progress using uh, open standards. However, it also became clear that some organizations hadn't moved uh, yet. So, therefore, uh, in addition uh, to the comply and ex or explain uh, list, standardization forum can also make agreements. Agreements with ultimate implementation dates. That might be handy, because we have already done so for several modern internet standards, like uh, you might know HTTPS and DNSSEC. Uh, and we have initial plans to make such an agreement for RPKI as well. Um, oh, sorry, I go back, because I wasn't finished yet uh, on, uh, <laughs> on that <laughs> number two. Eh? I have just finished uh, number one, the mandatory. If we go to cooperations, um, um, yeah, uh, we work together. Uh, let me uh, show uh, a little bit more. <laughs> Finally, we mandate also, apart from uh, number two, um, uh, we by specific open uh, standards law. For instance, the open standard HTTPS is now, since July the 1st uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and, uh, uh, obliged uh, by the law, the WDO, <laughs> the Digital Government Law. Um, if we go to the second block on the, the left uh, side, the cooperation, uh, we invest in community building. So we try to bridge the gap between technical experts and government uh, officials. So therefore, we're already happy with the, the internet standard platform, German just mentioned, and are actively participating in this platform. This cooperation enables us to be more effectively helpful, uh, helpful to governments with their technical uh, questions, and also with their questions regarding how to request uh, modern internet standards from their vendors. And the third block on your right side, we monitor the adoption of standards. So how do we do that? We review tenders and procurement docu documents. And for modern internet standards, we happily use, of course, the internet.nl, German mentioned already, to frequently measure of over about uh, two and a half thousand government domains. A small note uh, I can mention here is that since internet.nl now also has a test for RPKI, we will perform a large-scale uh, measurement for RPKI, and the results of this measurement uh, will be used in the decision process to set on ultimate implementation date for RPKI. All right, we go indeed to the next slide, uh, Sanish. Yes. In order to benefit the use uh, of, of open standards, it's uh, very important to, to have a certain critical mass. Because if only one or two organizations use the standards, the public society has no advantage at all, actually. So we need more and more uh, participants using open standards. And uh, by creating more uh, transparency, we create also more openness. We refer to an uh, analyst, uh, analysis of the Bureau of Economic Policy here uh, in the note under these two uh, uh, downwards in the sheet. Um, you can have a link if you like uh, from us. Um, furthermore, I go to the mandatory, uh, number one, uh, specifically. Um, as I told you, the we have a comply or explain list. And on that list, we have about 40 open standards. Uh, these standards are uh, uh, evaluated uh, through four criteria. Openness, added value, market uh, uh, support, and proportionality. Therefore, the critical mass, as mentioned before. A standard should be uh, actually proven in practice. That's very important. Open standards vary in different categories, uh, like, uh, well, of course, the internet and security standards. 
um, document standards and, and web standards, but also uh, for instance for administration like e-invoicing, but there are many more. And when the government invests, they should request for those relevant uh, standards. Government should use these standards in case they don't uh, use it, then they should report it and with a specific reason. For instance, if it ex costs extremely much money, then uh, they can report it in their annual financial report why they didn't use the open standards. Okay, we go to the next slide, please. Um, I already mentioned 40 uh, open standards, of which about 15 are related to the internet uh, security. And um, these standards prevent, uh, pr for instance, uh, from spoofing, eavesdropping, and, well, you might know uh, better already, but <laughs> those uh, are some of those uh, internet uh, standards. RPKI we already mentioned, but, uh, well, especially uh, DNSSEC and IPv4.6. In addition, security.txt is just a new one on our list. but very handy. Next uh, sheet, please. <laughs> we go, uh, as you recognize it, uh, to number two, the cooperation. So the, uh, to, go f uh, to get further in promoting the use of these open standards, we don't only mandate, but also indeed uh, cooperate, as I mentioned before. And we do that in a couple of ways, nationally, internationally. Uh, nationally, we uh, Gerben already mentioned platform internet standar standards, but also with the Secure Mail Coalition. Uh, last week, uh, my colleagues were in Mathieu and Riga, and uh, we're together with a lot of European countries talking about uh, the international possibilities. And um, we reuse internet.nl code as much as possible. Um, Denmark, Australia, Brazil already started with it, but we invite you as well if you are interested please take contact with us because we can help you. The code is in English available and, uh, well, we can assist uh, whenever you want in order to create that critical mass again because more people, then it works more sufficient and we have more knowledge gathering together and get it better every, every day. Besides that, we contact vendors and hosters. So think about Cisco, Microsoft, of course, Open Exchange, Google, Akamai, well, we can mention much more, but... Um, and as an example, Microsoft, uh, we contacted them uh, in order to uh, implement Dane, uh, support Dane uh, security standards. And this inspired Denmark as well to write a letter. And the results are with success, because uh, coming spring, 22, uh, 2024, uh, fully, uh, they will fully support uh, uh, the Dane uh, uh, security uh, uh, standard. So that is very, uh, we look forward to, to see that next uh, year. Microsoft uh, will uh, work together. Finally, the monitoring where I was talking about, we evaluate the tenders, as I mentioned, uh, on the relevant open standards, and we research whether those open standards are included. So um, apart from that, we take also contact with governments in order to check whether they requested open standards um, and are included in the offers of suppliers. If they didn't, then we call them and get in touch and uh, ask why. Uh, because some of them don't explain, uh, unfortunately, in the reports. So <laughs> we also would like to know why they didn't ask it. And uh, a lot of procurement departments don't even know how to start with it. So we support them with the text, ex special text for tenders. And we support them with a decision tree, which makes uh, it handy for people who are not so technically, uh, uh, don't have a technical act background, but a pr procurement background, can support them to ask for those uh, specific standards. Unfortunately, we conclude that these tenders still not fully complete uh, with open standards. That's a pity. And we report this once a year uh, to the cabinet in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, the internet.nl mentioned uh, already a couple of times. Uh, you see also this nice T-shirt. <laughs> if we, uh, if you score as a Dutch organization 100%, then you have a very special T-shirt. Uh, apart from the Hall of Fame, uh, of course, uh, Gerben mentioned. Uh, the actual usage of the open standards uh, is so measured twice a year. So twice a year we offer this also to the, the cabinet. 
Uh, and the tooling, uh, we can do that in mass, but also in, uh, if some organizations like to have their own uh, measurement, that's also possible, so please contact us. Uh, and we conclude that there is quite some growth in using the open standards due to the cooperation. So we mentioned already the cooperation with Microsoft, but also other um, vendors. Um, and that might, uh, yeah, well, that have results. That's good to hear. So it works. That's what it says. Good to know for you is that we sometimes uh, dig deeper. So, for instance, vendors who lag behind, we contact, and if there is room, we advise about the standards and so to use uh, the uh, so the use of uh, improves. And the last uh, final, well, actually, it says already: if you don't ask it, you don't get it. So that's for sure. Eh? So some lessons learned: uh, please make sure whenever your government tender, ask for open standard. And check it with the tool, the tooling internet.nl. Uh, Just like uh, Denmark, Australia, and Brazil <laughs> did, uh, uh, who did reuse uh, the codes. So I invite you if you have questions about that, but also hesitate like, is it something for our country or our government? Please feel free uh, to question. Thank you very much. I hand it over to Ola. Thank you. <coughs> and I just typed in uh, my personal domain, sorks.nl. In internet.nl, and yes, 100%, that t shirt is mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also, I just as a, as a remark, uh, I also have to smile a little bit uh, when you uh, talk about uh, modern internet standards, because some of the standards that you refer to as modern are indeed a quarter of the age of the internet itself. Um, however, the security.text. Uh, 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 standard um, has been published as RFC uh, 9116 in April 2022. So that is a really interesting fresh standard. And, and just to give you a little bit of, of a feeling why that uh, standard is so important. Um, the security.text standard is very simple. It says publish contact information of the person who is responsible for the security of your website in a specific location of your website. So that somebody who finds a bug, a vulnerability in your website, knows where to find that contact information. It's a very simple standard about, if you wanna know something, look there. And by doing so, you help people that do security research being able to contact the people responsible for the problems. And that makes a great difference in, in the security of the internet. Again, this is not about your own infrastructure, although this one helps, but it's also about collaborating in the greater good. And I, I think that security.text is an easy explainable example of, uh, of, of this. Um, a quick logistical question about, uh, will you take your uh, session now or shall we first uh, move on to... Uh, you'll take over, okay. Um, uh, th then, um, it, uh, Wout, you have something to report. I have. Uh, thank you, Olaf. Uh, my name is Wouter Natwis, and I am a consultant based in the Netherlands. And within the IGF community, I'm the coordinator of a dynamic coalition called Internet Standards Security and Safety, as you can see on this slide. And our strap line is making the internet more secure and safer. And that's, of course, something that everybody tells you and everybody says, but we actually came up with an action plan to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. That started at the virtual IGF of 2020, 2020 with a concept of a dynamic coalition. In 2021, we were able to present three working groups, and that is number one, two, and three you see on this list. And the first one is security by design on the Internet of Things, and that working group released its report this Tuesday here at the IGF. The second one is education and skills, and that already 
released its first report last year in Addis. And we'll come to number three very soon, and number five as well. Number four is internal, but also does analysis of our relevance compared to the Global Digital Compact and the Sustainable Development Goals, and that last report was also presented here at the IGF. Number six is data governance and privacy. That was supposed to be released, but that was done together with UNDESA, and they decided not to release so that we could not share that information here. Number seven is a skeleton that never came true, but I had a meeting today that may actually revive it very soon. So that is uh, encouraging news. Number eight is on DNSSEC and RPKI deployment, two standards that have been mentioned many times at this table already. But this is not about talking about the technique of deployment. We are going to try and produce a narrative that convinces people in decision-taking positions to actually procure secure by design. And it may be that they're always asked from a technical point of view, but these people probably need political or economical or social or security arguments to be convinced to invest or demand these secure levels of security. Number nine we announced is on emerging technologies. And also there we had several talks here at the IGF that are quite encouraging that we will be able to start this global comparison on policies that are being developed on AI, quantum, and perhaps in the future, future metaverses. Number 10, you see it's a dot, number 11 is a dot. Anyone who has an idea that would fit this dynamic coalition can step up to it and contact me or Mark Ravel, who is not here, but who is our senior policy advisor, and share your idea, and then perhaps we will see what we can do together. So let me proceed to number three and number five. Uh, that is what we are presenting on here today. Uh, next slide, please. So no, the working group number three is called Procurement and Supply Chain Management and the, and the Business Case. The person who should be presenting here is Liz Orembo, but apparently her session took a long longer than planned. And hopefully she come, still comes in, and if not, I will do the presentation completely. But uh, I, I have done it before. This is not really an issue. This Working Group produced its first report here at the IGF. So we released it on Tuesday. And what we did, next slide please, is, is a global comparison of procurement policies of governments. Next slide please. That what this group did was try and see how many procurement documents are available on the internet, but also to see if there from the government or from the private sector. What we found are only public documents. So we found 11. Oh, Mallory, you can take over right away. <laughs> There's a chair free. So I've only had the, at the first slides. You can sit and present if you like. Yeah. Really, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Literally, yeah. It's a great timing because I'm at the first slide. I was um, explaining what we were trying to achieve. So thank you. This is Mallory Nodal, and Mallory actually uh, did the, the, the whole planning and, and uh, the part of the research, and she was responsible together with Liz Orembo for the report. So Mallory, uh, great to have you here, and please uh, take over from me. Yeah, um, how much time do I have? I don't want to go on and on. Yeah. About 10? Okay, good, right. So. Sorry to just interrupt this whole flow, but I was at a different session um, and it just ended. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad the timing's worked out. Um, so yes, this is then the, the first slide um, where we're really explaining what the goal of this work has been defined as. Um, when we look at the procurement and supply chain management and the business case, that of course is in addition to other tactics where we can further uh, the security standards throughout the internet. Um, but at this very particular point, we also wanted to consider what is then the internet governance's role in, in this work? How could the IGF, from where it sits and all the stakeholders that participate in it, uh, benefit from this sort of research and perspective and guidance when talking at a high level about norm setting around um, the recommendations for procurement and uh, for supply chain management. So um, we will go to the next slide, please. 
do I have to do that myself? Okay, great, great. Um, and so, of course, we wanted to then, in the plan, you know, figure out where we're headed and how we're actually going to get there. And it primarily, to me, seems as to be a research project, assuming that there are, in fact, many procurement guidances out there already. Um, and the question really is, do they include and consider security standards? Um, and if, our if we are creating new guidance at the more global level, we want it to, of course, be impactful and to be taken up. So part of the research of figuring out what already exists in this space is an exercise in finding out who our main stakeholders would be and ensuring that the work product that comes out of it is any good. So that's what this slide really tells you. The, the um, text is, of course, too small for you to read um, here. But we identify the outcome um, as meeting global internet security standards is a, is a ubiquitous baseline requirement in any public or private sector procurement and supply chain management policy. Now, the different objectives speak to some of the different strategies I've just mentioned. We want to fully scope and map the, ver the variety of procurement policies that already exist to determine what are the, ch what are the current challenges and opportunities for people setting those policies. Um, the second um, objective is to make sure that we can distill that into very actionable guidance for anyone who is uh, writing these policies, either or, or refining them for that matter, or even implementing them. And then the last thing is, um, of course, we want to create um, a group and a community, a dynamic coalition, if you will, around this work so that it continues and it's strengthened by iteration, by continued research. So those are the three different objectives. There are different activities under each one that I'm not going to go ahead and elaborate, but just suffice to say, we're really just in the first bucket. We're really only looking at this very early stage at the research itself and the scope of what we're actually up to. So that's what we've been able to accomplish with this first research paper. The next subsequent, where we're distilling it into real guidance, where we're building a community of practice around this, that comes um, in the years to come. So next slide, please. Um, so yes, so this is what our survey um, achieved. Um, we really just had to, of course, create a research question, create sub-questions, actually go out and find source material to, to question, to um, you know, be, be curious about. So we were asking what has been done by others on procurement and supply chain management guidance? What is already out there? Um, there's a really uneven spread. You know, we sort of assumed at some point that we would hit on a gold mine, maybe like a regional document had been created and then all of the countries in that region had followed the document, but that never really actually happened. In fact, it's really patchy. You do have some European countries who have done something, but then you have, uh, and you have some like Latin American countries, but you know, it's not even, and it's actually not clear um, uh, where this sort of um, norm setting could happen, which indicates that there's a gap and that this is something we can actually do. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go through the terminology, but for the purposes of the paper, we do try to define what these concepts mean. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the methods was really quite straightforward. It was desk research. Um, we didn't get to a stage where we would do actually interviews with people. I feel like that might be uh, next phases where we're actually looking at you know, what kind of guidance would be helpful and actionable. You actually talk to people who've done this before and try to understand from them what they've done in a qualitative kind of way. But this is very just let's find all the documents we can that seem to fit the brief and read them and break them down. So um, we created sub-questions when we're asking. We were curious about only procurement that talks about cybersecurity, not all procurement. We don't care where people's pencils come from. Um, we then distilled it into, um, are they talking about, well, obviously they had to be published, that was the second one. And then we were looking for um, clues that security standards would actually be present in those documents. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yep, I think this is really straightforward. I just wanna say that we did take care in making sure that we had representative samples. Um, we were hoping to have um, a spread on language, but that was a challenge because the main researchers were English speaking. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had not just Global North countries, but also Global South countries. And we were looking, of course, for um, 
places where there was synergy between different procurement policies and then obviously where there are also gaps. Uh, next slides, please. We, um, in order to present the findings, we did actually track the findings we were, we were looking as through, we looking through all of these. We struggled to figure out at first how to present all the different findings because it was such a patchwork uh, sampling and not, there was not the synergy that we expected. So we went ahead and adopted an existing framework that comes from NIST that at least takes cybersecurity functions and breaks them out. So this just allowed us to be a little bit more incisive as we were distilling some of the advice that we found in the different documents. So I'm not going to go through this, but in the report it helps, it, it helps orient the reader a bit to this NIST framework so that you can see why we rationalized uh, presenting the findings in the way that we did. Uh, next slide, please. The conclusions, I think, are the most important part, so I won't rush through them so much. Other, um, I'll let you read them. I will um, just point out um, a few. So, um, actually, I'll just point out uh, two. Uh, I, I'm going to focus on the Netherlands for both of them, so you know um, we can all be proud of how well the Netherlands has done in this area. Um, it's not. It's something that we knew to expect going into it, but specifically the two that we thought were worth mentioning. Um, was that um, one of the very few procurement policies that even mentions standards at all was um, the coming out of the Dutch ministry, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce the name of the... was Toe of Leg Uitleist, and we just had a presentation about how both of these... Wonderful. So you all know already how terrific they were, but they turned up in our research as examples of things that we would like to see others potentially will make it into our guidance to follow. So next slide, please. The um, other sort of real conclusions here that I, I think are worth mentioning is then where this research points to future work because it was our intention all along to not really do anything new with this research but actually point the way towards what could be done. Um, and so I think we've done a good job of identifying um, and making a case for why we need to take uh, future action. And this is for others who really want to take up this work and want to um, you know, use the IGF as a platform to move some of this significant uh, work forward. So um, the open standards, open cy cybersecurity standards, should be points of reference and there, there's an opportunity to make use of that. Um, there are some international treaties that also um, would, could be translated into compliance mechanisms that could implicate uh, procurement and supply chain. Um, there are many places that do not even have standalone documents and it might be a good opportunity, or that haven't published them openly, I guess we could um, maybe give that caveat, but that that's an opportunity to, to, to do that and to encourage it, right? So if you have procurement policies, please publish them. If you don't yet have them, maybe you ought to consider it because it's quite important. Um, the fourth future work area is that we could also, you know, develop these frameworks, um, right? So this, I would imagine, would be in the larger um, work within the dynamic coalition where you connect this strategy, remembering it's one of many, to the, like the larger work that other people are doing within a framework. Um, there is also a need to do proper documentation, um, not in the sense of norm setting, but just in the sense of learning, monitoring and evaluation of um, how this works when there is an incident, We're folding that in and trying to learn from it in the context of procurement. Um, and then the very last thing is just, it would be really great in the IGF again to leverage the stake the multi-stakeholderism of this and to encourage more coordination. Um, we often feel like this might be a uh, you know conflict of interest to have industry and governments, especially when those industry are going after uh, you know those contracts, those procurement contracts. But in fact, um, that ability to collaborate um, and work more closely, I think, could have good effects. So that should be the last slide, but maybe we'll go one more. Let's see? Yeah. So of course, you can contact us. This is all um, information that's also in the report itself, so you don't need to uh, worry about this slide. Um, and I think that's it then. So thanks. <laughs> I hope that was on time. I didn't. Yes. Yeah. That, thank that you, Mary. That was perfect. Wout? Now I'm going on with the next slide. Ah, <laughs> good.
then it's not perfect, it's but it's <laughs> we'll it's manage. <laughs> it's definitely perfect what Mallory said, as you could, she voices it much, much better than I ever could. So thank you, Mallory, for, for joining us. Um, that, uh, but I think, and this is not on a slide, but from the other research that we've done, for example, on IoT security, what we see is the same what comes out here, is that the open internet standards that we're talking about are almost not recognized by governments. They're not in policy papers, let alone in legislation, which we're not advocating here. But the fact that governments don't recognize the existence of exactly that what makes the internet work is worrying. Because does that mean that they don't know it exists? Do they don't understand what the implications are if you don't protect that inner core of the internet? So that is a question that comes up in all our research. As you can see that we went through procurement study and global comparison study with the recommendations and the conclusions that you just saw. We also have a working group that is called Prioritizing and Listing Existi Existing Security Related Internet Standards and ICT Best Practices. What this working group has done, and also just like the procurement, thanks to the RIPE Community Fund that graciously funded all this work, is that if governments are to start procuring, there are probably 10,000 standards that need to be procured at some point in time. And it will probably be very overwhelming to explain to somebody who doesn't even know the first one exists. So we got together a team of experts and we asked them to list the most urgent existing open security standards out there. And it won't be a surprise that we asked the project manager of forum standardization to step in to help. But with people from India, from Latin America, from Singapore, and a few other countries, they got together and started talking. And through the past months, they came up with a list, which has been on consultation since last Tuesday. But what we try to do is to provide decision takers and procurement officers involved in ICT procurement with a list containing these most urgent internet standards so that they can actually have a tool to start working with and start understanding why this is so important. And then comes the working group I mentioned on, on the narrative that is gonna be another little component of this whole thing the IS3C is trying to produce. Next slide, please. So, and well, as I said that uh, there is a consultation going on since the 10th and you are happy to join it. The, the link can be provided at any moment. It closes on Sunday, the 5th of November. But what is it exactly that we are consulting? Next slide, please. So what did our pan advisory panel do? First, they started to grasp what the meaning is. After that, they decided, decided it needs scoping. And that scoping came down to four, four parts. And you can see that three of the four are the same as was presented just now by Annemieke. So the first one, these standards had to be interoperable. So that means that you do not only protect yourself, but you also protect somebody else. But somebody else also have to, has to protect you so it's about two sides that need protection to have an effect. The second one is they're all security related. So that leaves out a lot of other sort of standards. All these standards have to have an open process. So available for everybody. You don't have to pay, pay for them. You can access them. You can start using them without having to become a member of an organization or without nothing. You can just find it on the internet and deploy them. And finally, they have to be proven as a success. So others must have deployed them as well and successfully. And that's number four is different than from the forum standardization. You can see that this is an influence coming from other parties as well. When we decided on the scoping, we came to categories. And after a lot, lot, lot of discussions, we came to four categories. The first is data protection and privacy. 
The second, network and infrastructure security. The third, website and applications, web application security. And finally, communications and super security. And what was debated the most, should there be a fifth one on cloud security? Because that is some, one of the biggest topics out there and at this moment. But most of the experts said no, because these four categories go for the cloud. So we don't need a separate cloud component. They all function within the cloud. So cloud should adhere to these four. So the next step, well, when we had that, we could start thinking about which standards are actually going to be in that list. And that proved a lot easier than the scoping and the categories, because that was done in a few days and everybody more or less agreed, except the ones that I want that one and that one. But we want about 40, so that is manageable. And we have a concept list at this point in time. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna mention which are in there, but a lot have been mentioned by Anna Mieke because the most urgent one will be in her list, but there are differences. So people, other people from other places in the world stressed another standard. And that is what we're going to do next. In this con consultation document, we explain what we try to do. We motivate with arguments why we made the decisions that we make, but we want the wider community in the world to come in as well tell us if we scoped right or give us very good arguments to change it. Make good arguments why we need another category and suggest other standards. So if that happens, then in the second half of November, we come together as an expert team and I am the coordinator. I'm not an expert, I'll tell um, a historian doing a lot of work in this field, but not at hardcore techniques. It's decision time. So we're gonna de decide, the experts are going to decide whether the standard will be in there or not, or that the categories are changed because based on the arguments made. So hopefully by the half of December, we are able to present this tool and have another tangible outcome of this IGF process. And that, then needs to be proliferated, and that's exactly what Mallory says. It is something that will go immediately under her report. We're gonna present that as much as possible and share it with, with, with governments, and from there, hopefully, we'll get the traction to improve procurement policies in the near future. So that will be a second project, and with that, I am conclude. Thank you, <coughs> Olaf. Perfect, thank you. Um, I promised that there would be some question time, and I will allow for questions, but I hope there are none, because then we, will, we are exactly in the planned time scale again. <laughs> I, I do have a question, but I'll leave it till after the, uh, the, the, the session so that, uh, yeah. Ah. Um, I have a question about um, the testing website for, um, at least in the Netherlands, for, uh, for websites, which is really working very well. I just tested my own website and it was 100%, so, t -shirt. <laughs> t -shirt. <laughs> so I want a T-shirt. Um, and, and I think it would be a really good idea to, uh, and that's what you're doing here as well, to promote the use of these kind of testing websites internationally. But there is, may also be some interesting advancements of the Dutch website. For instance, I'm thinking of a few more soft uh, uh, standards, such as accessibility, or and maybe in the future testing the, um, uh, the sustainability uh, elements of your website. So I would love to make a strong case for um, including those kind of standards on that website as well. I think that the people uh, responsible are in the room. <laughs> work? It, uh, does, it doesn't work, yeah. Well, we are not responsible for that, but people can apply those uh, standards and accessibility, of course, is already on it because it's obliged in the, the Netherlands. Uh, W C H uh, G, um, and I know that uh, there is developing in, in the Netherlands uh, also at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Infrastructure also 
are combining internet.nl with other uh, dashboards like accessibility. So people are thinking about it, but now it's, it's uh, a thing to get all the ideas together. Because everyone is, um, uh, uh, well, inventing the wheel again. And that's not uh, good, of course. So it's a good uh, issue you point out, uh, Valerie. So uh, there must be more experts together to combine that and uh, one dashboard. So we're pushing that as well. Good suggestion. Thank you. The person at the mic was uh, Valerie Fressen, just for the record. Um, good. Uh, next part of the session, but I, I just noticed something, um, uh, and, and we often forget that these sessions are made possible uh, and accessible, actually, on that point of accessibility, by people doing real work. And I just saw a name in the Zoom room, uh, Rochelle is doing the captioning. And I would like to thank Rochelle and her team for her hard work here, because it really makes a difference in these type of... Um, of environments. Um, <coughs> let's see. Um, yeah, I think that's appropriate. Um, <laughs> Satish, you have perspectives from yes. India. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, love. My name is Satish, and I'm from India. And I'm going to share. Uh, uh, two slides on what, or three slides on what we are trying to do in India, which is inspired again by the Dutch initiative. Uh, I'll skip this. Um, so the background of uh, what we're trying to do is that the first kind of step was in 2016 when some of us founded the India School on Internet Governance. And we started cooperating with the GFCE, uh, with uh, Martin. Martin and I were together in ICANN, so we kind of uh, you know, we talked and you know we decided to have a collaboration with the GFCE. So 2018, we had the first workshop. In fact, Olaf was there in Delhi for that workshop. Uh, this is a day zero program of the India School on Internet Governance. Uh, and this workshop is called the Internet Infrastructure Initiative Workshop of GFCE, which is a global forum for cyber expertise. And we repeated these workshops, 2018-19, uh, then two years of COVID-22, and a couple of weeks back, 23. Uh, as day zero events of uh, INSIG. Now, the IIII workshop seeks to enhance justified trust in the internet by building awareness and capacity on internet-related international standards, norms, best practices. So in the 2023 edition, a couple of weeks back, we announced a new initiative called the uh, India uh, Internet Initiative, uh, that is the Trusted India Internet Initiative, T3I, which tries to measure the uh, the compliance to the standards of Indian websites, uh, websites, DNS and email services, etc., to modern security standards. So what we did was we made a list of about 400 websites, the most popular websites in different categories, government and finan financial uh, institutions, sports institutions, etc., etc. And then we ran it through internet.nl, uh, kind of a, on a scripted basis. And we have these numbers now, preliminary numbers. Uh, we are trying to kind of completely explain these numbers. Uh, we're not going to release individual information for, of a particular website, but we, in these groups, we can actually compare. So we're getting a good picture of the current status of compliance, and it is pretty bad. So uh, we are trying to kind of monitor this bunch every six months, and we will then see the kind of transition, what happens uh, you know, uh, over the period of time. So in India, the, the whole digital thing is very, very uh, important for us. Uh, India is betting heavily on digital technologies for its growth. Uh, it has made uh, several strides in digital transformation. Uh, for example, th the digital public infrastructure called India Stack, and multiple digital public goods, including the when the COVID was there, we had this huge uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, website for vaccines. Now, India is one of the most populous countries in the world, if not the most popul uh, pop populous. And the India stack, so whatever application we, we build, it has got to be scalable to that citizen scale, which is 1 billion plus. So these are really large applications. Uh, and these include uh, you know, financial, health, logistics. Even in the smallest villages, we see people using uh, mobile phones to transact money, I mean, move money. Now, some of us are very nervous when we see this growth. It is good in a way, but when you look at the, the underlying, the core in internet itself, we find that uh, they are not kind of complying to the latest standards. Uh, so this is actually worrying, and that is why we kind of created, thought about this, this initiative, 
uh, this is completely based on uh, volunteer work. Uh, and currently, we're trying to raise them seed funding for uh, creating, recreating internet.nl kind of a thing for India. Now, India, as was mentioned about accessibility, we have some additional requirements. And one th important thing is the multilingual part of it. Uh, and we also have something called the universal acceptance, which is a challenge. Now, this is when you create a domain name in a script other than Latin, say in, in Hindi, the Devanagari script, and you create an email out of it. And then, th then we find that that email does not work. It does not work in many uh, websites. So that the reason is that uh, the, pro the programmers who created the software have not programmed for this kind of email IDs. So this is a huge problem. It doesn't even work in the big tech companies like Google. Uh, so we are the ICANN is trying to now resolve that problem. But for India, when we wa want to test for these things, we have to test on these uh, angles as well. So we're trying to add to the code, of course, uh, while making it open source itself so that other people can also use it. Uh, so we are trying to recreate the internet.nl uh, uh, with some more features that are specific to Indian requirements. And we plan to periodically run this test and disseminate the results to all stakeholders in the country. And we hope to be you know, kind of nudging or pushing them to kind of adopt these standards. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, India has, like many other countries, India has no uh, law that says you have to comply with all this. So we are trying to work from bottom up uh, through the community effort to kind of get these institutions to uh, start implementing these standards. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Use the microphone, that's true. Um, yeah, thank you for that. That was very clear, very concise, and even comprehensive. Thank you. Um, the Brazilian situation uh gilberto and flavio let's let's see if gilberto is uh, audible so gilberto on zoom can can you speak something yes perfect okay. we, we hear perfect. you here so i now okay, hand over good. the microphone to you and to flavio okay i wish i'm sharing my presentation okay w we can you see my presentation yes we can Okay, good. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this event. I am Gilberto Zorello. I am a product manager from Brazilian Network Information Center, NIC.br, that implements the decisions and projects designed by, by Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, uh, CGIBI, which is responsible for the coordination and integration of uh, all internet service initiatives in the country. Okay. Presentation is about the, the top test of padrões in Portuguese or test standards in English based on the internet.nl tool in, in the security recommendations that must be adopted uh, on, on uh, networks on Brazil. Uh, uh, DKPR is proposing these standards uh, to Brazil. That's the that's the idea. Uh, that's our agenda for this presentation. Uh, that, uh, NICPR, the, uh, the Brazilian uh, Network in, in Information Center, NICPR is a non-profit civil uh, entity that since two, 2005 uh, has been assigned with that administrative and operational uh, functions related to the .pr domain in Brazil. Uh, in addition to providing and maintaining the domain uh, names registration activity, NICBR uh, goes beyond similar entities in, in other countries. We invest in actions and projects that, that bring a series, uh, a series of, of benefits to improve the internet infrastructure in Brazil. Uh, with a revenue collected exclusively uh, through the, the provision of the domain name registration. Uh, some of our efforts are focused on many sectors of Brazilian society, disseminating knowledge about best practice uh, to, to be adopted in new in networks and related areas. In some cases, we threaten relationships with private, uh, governmental, and non-profit entities to encourage the adoption of best practice to be adopted uh, in internet services. 
the, 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 the top project here in Brazil. Uh, the, the project was developed by Nick PR to disseminate the best secret press in Brazil for websites, email, service, and user connection to internet. Uh, it uses the open source code provided by the implementation. Uh, the project is part of the program of a safer internet in Brazil, which works with ISPs, uh, internet service providers, and, and incumbent operators to disseminate the best security uh, practices uh, that they should implement on their respective networks. Then, uh, top BR, uh, we, uh, in Brazil, we are using uh, in, the, in this program as a part of this program. Okay, the <clears throat> the operation was started in December uh, of the 2021st and uh, can be assessed by top.nic.br in this domain. Uh, the uh, a little about the the program. Okay, the program is acts in support of internet technical community in reduction of denial of safety attacks. Uh, uh, a cert PR, the a team inside the, the, the NIC PR, sends notification to the, the, the technical community in Brazil about this, the, this, this problems. Uh, 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 improvement of, of the network routing security according to manners recommendations. Manner is a, is a internet uh, society initiative. Uh, we, we, uh, the, the, the program is spread, then as security best practices according to top recommendations, uh, disseminate the best practices to configuring websites and email services according to top recommendations, recommendations too, and encourage the, the, the implementation of, of IPv6 in final users and internet services using top uh, as a testing tool, uh, a test, testing tool. Uh, uh, the plans, plans of action of, uh, uh, performed by, by Nick BR. Uh, we have several teams inside the, the Nick, uh, Nick BR, SET BR, security, SEPTRO, uh, the internet products, uh, registro, registro of, of, of domains, uh, ix.br and systems. That the, the, this group, these groups create uh, creates uh, uh, technical teaching materials and some good practices, uh, raising awareness in the, the technical community uh, by lectures, course, and training, uh, having direct interaction with network operators by bilateral meetings to explain how to implement uh, the, the the best practices. Uh, and recommended in each uh, situation. Defining KPIs to, to monitor the effectiveness of, of actions. That's the, the ideas of the plan. Some results of the plan now. Uh, we have some statistics. Uh, this statistic shows the quantity of IP addresses notified the, well, with misconfigured service. Uh, note the reduction of the, uh, since the beginning of the, the, the program and now, uh, uh, the reduction uh, is about seventy percent of the, this this kind of problems. The other the other issue that we we work in inside the program is uh, implementation of uh, manners in Brazil. Uh, uh, manners. Uh, uh, this statistic shows that the distribution uh, by country of internet providers participating of manners initiative. Uh, not that, that Brazil has the largest number of participants. In, in, in is increasing every year. Uh, 20, 25% of the, the manners participants is uh, 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 comes from, from Brazil. And now we have some statistics for, uh, for the, the top implementation. We started in, in the end of uh, uh, 20, uh, 2021. And we have some, uh, uh, we are increasing the, the tests. This statistic shows the, the number of connection tests performed, uh, uh, the percentage of recursive DNS server and users with IPv6 implement, implemented, uh, the percentage of DNS services validating the protocol DNSSEC. Uh, now we have stat some statistics about the website tests, uh, the number of unique uh, domains tested, 
uh, the number of percent uh, and percentage of tests per, that passed by by subtests, and the number of uh, sites that get get uh, tested a hundred percent, the Hall of Fame, uh, in our case. Uh, it is similar uh, uh, statistic for email tests. Uh, many associations, uh, ISPs, Internet Service Provider Association, support. The, uh, this pro the, the program here in Brazil, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, top. Uh, and academia, too. Uh, academia is uh, RNP, and the other, the Connexis is an uh, incumbent operators uh, uh, association, and other uh, uh, associations here are uh, association of uh, uh, internet service provides. Uh, uh, Brazil has more than 10,000 internet service providers. Small and medium uh, 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 operators around the country. That's a, a specific situation of Brazil. Okay, We have, of course, incumbents uh, responsible for uh, about 50% of the internet traffic here in Brazil. And the, the rest of the, the traffic, uh, uh, these small, is small and medium operators uh, are responsible for the rest of the, the, the traffic in Brazil. Uh, uh, some remarks of the implementation. Uh, uh, top was delivered in, in end of the uh, uh, 21st, uh, currently running version 1.4 uh, of uh, internet.nl. Today, we don't have secret uh, uh, yet and our PKI. Okay. But the version uh, 1.7 is implemented in, 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 in test server. Uh, we are now validating the, the implementation. We intend to deliver the end of the, this year. Uh, the, the best practice recommended by the, by the two are, are recommended for, from NICBR to, to technical community in Brazil. This is, then uh, the, the idea is to, this best practice uh, 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 Nick proposed for the, the, the technical community uh, uh, to, in Brazil, uh, together with uh, uh, best practices of uh, uh, manners and the best practices proposed by by Certibe.br. The tool is being disseminated together uh, with the program uh, in, the, in the country uh, and the technical events. Uh, for specific sectors uh, such government, uh, uh, academia, uh, internet operators. Uh, the, the accounting area of uh, Brazil's legislature carried out uh, many tests uh, some months ago. They, that the, the, the government is started using the, the tool to test their, their, their sites, but the, they are, uh, this is in the beginning. That's the, that's the point here in Brazil. Uh, the, uh, the top two provides important indica uh, indications of the, the implementation status of recommended uh, best practice and provides a baseline for operators to implement them in their, uh, their networks. That, that's a, my main point of uh, the, the talk, is that created this baseline in order, these operators this, under the, this, this line they, they work to get this, this baseline. This is a very important tool for our, our country. Uh, Brazil has continental dimensions and it's a challenge to keep up uh, with uh, the, the evolution of the use of the, the standards here in Brazil. Uh, that's my uh, short presentation. We are ready for uh, any question if you, if you have. Thank you very much. Flavio, were you adding something or just for the questions? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for this, uh, uh, Gilberto. Um, uh, very good to have you with us. It's, uh, we, ha we are exactly on the dot on time. It's quarter to uh, two or three. Um, are there any questions? I'm looking around. I'm looking online. There was a question earlier whether these sessions are being recorded um, and they, they are recorded and will be made available on the IGF website later. 
Um, I do have a substantive question, though. Um, I'm not quite sure who on the panel uh, could answer that, and maybe somebody in the in the in the um, in the audience. Um, takes a little bit of introduction. Um, in Europe, we have a regulation. Uh, it's quite involved. Uh, regulation number 1025 2012. So this is a regulation from 2012. Um, which um, allows the identification of technical specifications that are eligible for pro public procurement. There is a whole procurement law in, in Europe, which I'm not a specialist on, um, but the idea was that specifications that were not made by formal standards organizations, such as Sensenelec, ETSI, ISO, ITU, and national standards bodies, would need to be whitelisted, identified, in order to be used in European uh, procurement, and perhaps even in the member states. I do not know exactly. The standards from fora and consortia are not by default on those lists. And the fora and consortia that we're talking about are IEEE, uh, ITF, uh, W3C, and all those type of things. Um, when the forum was set up, we went through a, a quite a extensive process to whitelist a number of uh, standards, and uh, um, DNSSEC is in there, DKIM is on there, IPv6 is on there. So there are a couple of them. But that standard, that, that process sort of halted. And so this is not to comment on, the, on that process, but more on the question, if you do procurement, do you run into the situation that the public authorities can only refer to standards made by formal standards bodies? That was a long-winded question, but I think that that final question said it all. Yeah. Um, Walter Natris, that the only thing I can share with you here is that when we started the Dilemma Coalition, the Commission pointed us to a person in the Commission who was involved in this process with the Member State. And when I talked to them, basically it came down to we're not doing very much anymore because it took more than one, half, one and a half year to even start talking about an open standard let alone deciding that it was validated by this commission. And this is the last news I have from two years ago, so I don't know what it is now, but they never came back online to me since. So uh, maybe you know more, Alisa, but um, it was not an encouraging answer I got from these people. So that's what I know. The question is, of course, how did the Netherlands come up with the comply and complaint list? Did they... Complain. Uh, uh, <laughs> compel, whatever, uh, I'm tired, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, uh, ex explain this, that were, were they validated or were it just decided it, it just makes common sense to have this on, do you know? Thank you. Um, it's, it's, I don't know whether it's on that list. No, I don't. Uh, n I don't know that European uh, because you say the so DNSSEC is oh on your list. Yeah, the oh the sorry, yeah, the so DNSSEC so is on our but list. But are they have they been whitelisted by the Dutch government first, or we just decided we have to have them on the list because in the Europe they are not mm -hmm. validated in the e e European Commission. Well, uh, those standards are uh, supplied by uh, m m a maintenance uh, uh, other people. They offer the standard like this is very important. So um, I'm not sure uh, by head is it this IETF or uh, who's uh, doing it? Yeah, IETF. But a lot of uh, organizations like NCSC uh, says this is a very important standard. We uh, adjust it, and if more organizations in Holland says that, then they, uh, it's proven experience that it is uh, practiced. So that is one of the criteria in order to come at uh, the comply or uh, explain so list. So I I, I think. We have a research question here, <laughs> looking yes. at uh, Mallory. Sure. Well, so I mean, just to say, we, this doesn't come, in, come up in our research because we weren't looking for it. Um, it could be maybe a separate question that could, you know, 
be done. I actually think the source material for this would be different as well um, because it's maybe you're actually asking in practice how does this work. It could also be a qualitatively done. I will just say anecdotally, I know there are some U.S. companies that when they're considering going for a contract with a government in Europe or tendering or so on, they will then often initiate the standardization then. So it, it may be just a consideration of workflow, right? If I've got a technology and I'd like uh, procurement in the EU, then I e need to demonstrate that the standards I'm using in this are either in existing um, bodies that have um, been listed or that they you can initiate the whitelisting at that point, or you've got technology that hasn't yet been standardized at all, and you might as well start doing it in Etsy um, because that will be the quickest track. So I know that the companies have that calculus in their heads about how to go after contracts. So maybe that's another answer to the question is it's not always a predetermined, oh, I know that this standard is going to be important in the European market. It might come only when it, the market entrant actually happens. Are there other questions from the audience or from the panel? Oh, go ahead. Thanks, Olaf. Walter Nathus. Is, Ger is Germen still online? Yes, he is. Yes. Hi, Gerben. Who is it? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> um, here. That I, I've got a question for you because the the internet.nl, the standards that are there, are often uh, something is added to it. What kind? What would be the next that you are thinking of, and how do you come to the to the decision to add specifically that standard? So, what is the next phase for internet.nl? Well, it is more or less the same as uh, explained by uh, Anna Mieke. Um, participants in the Dutch uh, Internet Standards Forum can contribute by asking if the others agree that, for example, universal acceptance as one of the, uh, the standards that we have considered should be added to our test environment. And then the process is simple. If everybody agrees that it is a, um, a good uh, standard to dive into. The next step will be that we look into available tests already from the international community, open source. Um, and if they are available, how well they would combine with internet.nl, can we actually implement them in the test tool? And if not available, we look into the possibility to create our own code. Um, and Sometimes that works uh, just as well as, as finding uh, stuff uh, already open source online. But sometimes you also have to conclude, for example, in, in, in uh, relation to the accessibility standards, that they do not integrate too well in our current test environment. So then we decide to promote them. So um, have a news item featuring um, universal acceptance or uh, the accessibility standards. And um, we will keep them more or less as pairs for the future whenever we have the resources or the technology available to include them. That, that's more or less the process. And, and, and as we learned from the other session, uh, sometimes uh, uh, there was another session on internet.nl this week. Uh, sometimes it's just impossible to measure something like uh, route validation. We were talking about routing security in that in that uh, session. Um, looking around once more, going, going, gone. Um, that ends this panel. I think what we learned here um, is uh, 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 that there are tools to increase the visibility of uh, 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 of the of the standards that are needed to secure um, our global environment, um, name and shame in the form of uh, Internet NL, more name than shame, uh, granted, but also uh, uh, procurement me me methodologies, um, making sure that the initiative is felt where it's felt most, namely in the wallet. Um, and I think these are great initiatives. Um, I think that the next thing that uh, needs to happen is that more countries or environments or regions start using tools like this. 
So we have another deployment issue that we need to tackle. And uh, with that, I leave that in the good hands of the Dynamic Coalition uh, and would like to all thank you for being here. Have safe travels home uh, and have a good sleep. <laughs> huh? The consultation, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The consultation, um, you saw, uh, maybe that slide can be uh, 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 reprojected quickly. Oh, le let me let me just tell it that um, we have a website www.is3 the number three coalition.org. The reports that I mentioned can be found there, and the the consultation is announced there. It has a link to a Google Doc where everything is included and everybody is allowed to, has that link, is allowed to make remarks. And we close it on the 5th of November. Thank you for the opportunity again, uh, Olaf.